Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Well, hello, well, there. hello I there. I hope that you can hear us. Getting some, getting feedback. some feedback. Are you, Are you getting feedback? feedback? So this, so this is, is the first time we're doing a webinar with both Jeff and I, I in the same room. room. I, apologize I apologize for a late start. We're here at the LT Speed Building in Long Island, Island City, City in, in New York City, New York City. in Queens. Um, just gonna and welcome to Cost of Vacancy. Uh, this is a presentation that we've done quite a few times. We've had so many requests over the last couple of weeks that we've decided to go ahead and uh, do a repeat, especially for those of you who've been talking to us about how am I going to plan next year, uh, going into 2025? How can I bring more values to the table? How can I know what the real ROI of talent acquisition is and how do we get there? So pretty excited about that. Just do we have a deck that we can pull up yet or? Again, I apologize. Yes, we had some technical difficulties this morning since we're remote. I wish I could show everybody here the view because we're, we're on the 49th floor looking over the Manhattan skyline. It's absolutely beautiful here today. We have a deck, Jess? There we go. So as always, I'm here with Jeff Alberto. You can also see her just as our director of process engineering. So before we launch into um, the cost of vacancy and where where we're um, talking about planning for next year, we're talking first about our unemployment rates. You can see, you know, here we go again. The the world of talent baffling analysts, messing with Wall Street, um, and and confusing everybody because what is happening. I think that we have been doing this long enough and looking at these numbers long enough post pandemic to say we are now right sizing, becoming more stable, um, right sizing, meaning as far as right metric, I would call it. So getting to the point where we we do understand what's going on with employment um, and it is it is stabilizing. Yet we have these very volatile, um, very volatile segments that we'll take a look at and talk about in just just a second but here's our unemployment rate up in july down in august it'll be interesting to see what happens in september um just you want to flip us one of the things that i will note is earlier this year um we had talked about what these metrics mean and living in the i'm going to say lack of better term deer and headlights that happened when ai hit uh, about this time last year I can tell you across the board with all the different types of organizations that we meet with, our customer base, our prospective customer base, all of our HR friends, we are seeing um, good news to TA. We are seeing a big uptick um, in recruiter positions. We are seeing more stabilization in hires, and we are seeing the triggers being pulled on requisitions that sat for a long time. Given year to year, meaning October, September to September of this year, so September 23 to September of this year, in the talent acquisition space within organizations, bumpiness of AI, the uncertainty of what's just happened because we've come out of pandemic. I think we're past that now. Um, there were some of us who said that we thought the fourth quarter, even though we're going into an election year, is going to be a, a positive sign, and that's happened. Uh, so looking at 2025, I know we're seeing a lot of good press about what's happening economically um, and to our, you know, our economies at, at all different scale levels at this point, but certainly in talent acquisition, I think we're going to see the steadiness. I think we're um, much more mature than we were going into the pandemic. And I think now that much of the stunners are, are we've surpassed them, mastered them, we're looking at things that are much more likely. Okay. This is the JOLTS report that came out yesterday. Let me go back a second, Jeff. So the JOLTS report, from the JOLTS report, looking at job openings, again, another baffling number, right? So it went down to 7,700,000, which really is not a big, big jump. I mean, I, I kind of dramatize these on here because I like to look at what's happening. I think we're going to stay stable around that 70, the, the upper sevens to the 8 million ads. I don't think we're going to see that change very much. Um, we haven't seen it change too much, but I think we're, you know, I don't think we're going to see any big decline there. Okay. So on that note, let's move ahead, Jeff. Um, this is a great article that came out in Fortune. And yes, Fortune, I, I became a subscriber because I couldn't get this article. So we're going to put the, we'll send the link out with the deck so that you can take a look at it. 
But those of us that we've been having these conversations, some of the people on, on the call today too, know on the webinar today about, do we really need more jobs? How many more jobs do we need? Look at, I, I love the title of this. I'm not a big fan of catch titles, but Biden's $52 billion bet on chips has a big problem. American semiconductor firm takes twice as long to hire as anyone else. Now, I don't like that last line because I, is that comparing Apple store? I mean, this goes on to say Korea is not having as many, China is hiring faster. We do know that they're hiring faster. We do know that they're different economies. But I mean, here's case in point, media will be telling us routinely, there's not enough jobs. We need more jobs. We need to have more jobs. We need to bring in more jobs. And then we're like, okay, well, who's going to do these jobs? It's not a matter of, of the jobs. It's a matter of us in talent acquisition and in HR and in all of our organizations saying, What's the talent I'm going to need and how do I get better at doing that? Whether it's up training and upskilling my internal team, looking at my referral base differently, looking at how I'm sourcing and looking at my incoming, but really starting with what am I going to need and putting real practices around that. Uh, I know this is my soapbox. Making talent acquisition is, is our life here at People Science and it's certainly my life. The better we get at this, the more we're going to be able to protect our economies. Okay. Ready, Jess? There we go. Uh, and then I, I don't know if you've joined. What what month was that? Oh, Jess is in the other room. But I'm. Can you hear me, Jess? Yeah, you hear me. Okay. I I don't remember what month it was that we talked about how do we as HR come into these. And I know it was Danielle Diliberto and Lorna Hagen that were on. We we're talking about going into an election year. We prepared for conflict in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't remember what month that was, but we do have a copy of that on our web on our um, webinar. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, sometime in the summer. But I think um, a, it's interesting that economy is kind of saying, okay, we're not going to pay attention to politics in some ways, right? Even though they do and they don't, it's not seem to having a big effect on them. But I do think that it's interesting that we're still living in this country divided, and dare I say, companies divided. Right. Not so much the employees internally. Uh, and, you know, we were giving this some thought the other day. But when you look at your organization, let's say you were to say my organization, if my organization was a generation, a person in a generation, what generation would it be in? So if you look, take a look down here, would you be a boomer legacy organization? Are you more like a Gen X organization? Now, I'm not talking about just the people. I'm saying the organization, organization itself. Do you think you're a millennial or a Gen Z? And this comes from this reoccurring theme that we have here, that when we work uh, with some of the more established organizations, 20 plus years old, that have been around in the marketplace, we call them more like our legacy organizations, you know, the built to last, the, the, the good to greats that have been around a really long time, which that list is much smaller than it used to be, although it's growing, right? That's a different culture than when we look at our startups and what we might call our Gen Cs or younger millennials. But I do think knowing where your organization is, particularly from an HR perspective, I mean, who else Who else would own that, right? So in reminiscence of this, and, and actually one of the catalysts to this thought process is, is this fellow over here who worked at Waffle House. If you're not a TikTok follower, I'll, I'll tell you it's interesting because he had been working as a short order cook at Waffle House, I think his TikToks were delightful and funny and entertaining. And he would often turn the camera around and look at the patrons and they would have a, a great time. The challenge was that Waffle House, maybe coming at this from a different perspective, said, you can't do this anymore. And we want you to stop filming. And he said, OK. And then they said, well, we want you to take your TikTok down. So he doesn't work there anymore. This to me, this and the title of this TikTok, if you want to look it up, is hard no for him. His his handle is short order cooking. But was this a missed opportunity? Is this is this one of those situations where compliance or legal came in and said, let's be really protective? Whereas the opportunity that was there to keep that connection with social media and manage it could have elevated them even either further. If you have any comments about that that you want to put in the um, in the chat, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. But interesting. And if that was to happen to you in your organization, you know, how how would that work out? How would that play out for you? Uh, and I know there are still organizations out there that have 
purely no interface for their employees with social media. I know when it first came out, that was an issue, right? But these days, is that still the case? Awesome. All right. So let's move along into defining the true cost of vacancy. I want to remind you, and Jess, maybe you can put this in the chat, that there is a calculator that you can use on our website. It's totally free. We don't retain the information. It is like a sample of a calculator. So you're going to need more than the data that's sampled on there, but it'll give you a good a guide sheet to follow. Ready, Jess? Yes, we'll okay. also send an email out after the webinar, Christine, that'll have a link to that calculator as well. Perfect. So what does the cost of vacancy mean? The cost, think of the cost of vacancy point blank as a profit and loss statement per position. And I'm just gonna pause there because I'd like you to just think in terms of one position. And how much does it cost the organization every day that position is open? So if the position, sales is the easiest to use. However, this extends to every position. It might, might be a little bit more complicated and we'll look at some of those factors when you move away from sales. But I'm gonna start by talking in terms in the sample that we use right now as sales reps. So it's a little easier to say, Jess is a salesperson and she's bringing in $1,000 a year in sales just as a number. So if the revenue that we're getting, and then we, we go to finance and we say, what's the profit from that? And they say it's $100. Now we know we're starting with $100 and now we're gonna deduct our cost from the profitability, a profit and loss statement per position. Now I just wanna take another pause and think about the ramifications if you had that information. Pretty much nobody, if you, unless you've done this work, which so few companies have, Nobody in your organization knows this. Yet decisions are made continuously. Let's open this position. Let's close this position. Why are we? Why do we have this division without taking a close look at this? It almost always is ran from the business perspective of what the business thinks is viable, which is great. But without people, whether it's one person or six thousand people for a you know for a division, it's the people cost of the position that has a huge impact. To me, it's always amazing that this isn't one of the first pieces that, that any organization would go to, either building their business plan or in their yearly planning across the board. So at the cost of the organization while the position remains open. This is where it gets a little confusing because a lot of times in, in um, talent acquisition, we're used to what is my price, what's my price per hire? What's my price per hire? This is reverse engineering. Well, how much is it costing for the position to be open? So sometimes we have to remind ourselves, and even in leadership meetings, we have to remind the leaders, no, we're talking about how much it's costing every day for it to be open. Um, so the equation, it is a simple equation, though it gets a bit complex as we try to calculate it. The value of position minus the cost of the position equals the cost of vacancy. And then the position's profit and loss statement, which we just messaged. Okay. So here's some of the power that comes from the cost of vacancy. And, you know, every time we talk to somebody and they're feeling powerless or they can't get where they want to go with their uplines or they can't make the impression that they want to make, I like to say, well, how are you doing with your cost of vacancy? Because that's really where you can get, not only is it kind of like stunning to some people, like, what are you talking about? But it really starts to build the value of what you're doing. So the culture and the employee retention. Understanding the value of the employee and better respect for their work, right? If I know what the value is you bring to your organization, I might think twice before I complain about Harry, right? I might think twice before I say, well, you know, especially if you're with legacy organizations or Gen X organizations, again, you know, just using these as terms, that are, are built on, those organizations are built on a different mindset than what we're seeing come into the market today and where we see the bulk of people in the uh, in in work, what their thought process is. So this is a really good way to start to build that kind of how am I viewing my employees. The higher value creates more engagement for management to employ. So if I if I feel like you have more value, I'll talk to you longer. I'll coach you harder. I'll spend more time with you because I understand the value that you bring. The employee's confidence increases and it leads to more engagement. The more you value me, you know, it's and Jeff, isn't it kind of ironic? Because this work doesn't get done and all we ever talk about is how we need to value our employees better. I right. guess. 
kind of baffling, right? Start with the end in mind with the COV. Um, and that's how you get more engagement, right? You value me more, I engage more, and that it just increases the value for everybody in the organization. And it helps with the employee feeling more be, uh, more valued and their own wellness because people who feel valued feel are healthier, they last longer, they're more productive. So you can really change an entire environment with the, with the one metric. So under business operations and planning, there's more detailed cost analysis, a lot more detailed cost analysis. There's more accurate budgeting. There's the comparison cost to the employee versus dissolving an entire department or division. When I first started doing this work, the very first customer we had was deciding whether or not they were going to close a division with about 3,800 people in it. I mean, think of the effect there. And at first glance, I was like, and, and they really brought us in because they were getting, it was a down cycle in, in employment. Uh, everybody was laying off and they were saying, well, we think we're going to dissolve this division because it hasn't been profitable in a lot of years. And we went back and, and so we were really retained to help them make that case actually by finance to make this case so they could bring it to the business into the C-suite and dissolve it. And the opposite happened because once we did the work, we found out the value and we're like, wait a minute, this shouldn't be outsourced. It shouldn't be dissolved. This is something that should stay. And then interestingly enough, a year later, we did the same analysis for the organization for a different division that they had never considered that needed to be, that really needed to go away. And, and they actually partnered it out, sold that division to somebody else. That's the kind of power that comes from here. And wouldn't it be great if that came from TA? Um, a different view of profitability of a division department and position that comes into play. So not only are we saying this is the cost of vacancy for the position, we know that if our customer service channel is worth, if those positions are open, it's costing us $600 a day. That's a true number for one of our customers, by the way. Costing you $600 a day to have this open, it makes you look at customer service in that department completely differently. It's the old adage, like what brings more value, the highest um, salesperson in the company or the receptionist who orchestrates and makes everything run well, right? Until you do the analysis, you, you really just don't know. Um, outsourcing or insourcing decisions this is a, a really good building tool. You know, we're in the recruitment processing, we like to say partnering, not outsourcing group, but this is a lot of the foundation that we'll do before we go in as a partner. For workforce workforce planning, you can make more sound decisions. You know, um, we're engaged with a company right now that is saying, is is this particular um, division, should we really be adding headcount here? Should we be reducing headcount here? When you look at the cost of vacancy, you're able to say, yeah, we're at headcount, but we always have this 20% churn. So we need to make sure that we're continuously recruiting because it's costing us $6,000 a day every day this position is open. Changing your recruiting budget. Right. They're looking at you different. Well, yeah, you need these tools so that you can keep the TA group going so that we can fend off this 20 percent or be ready when the 20 percent churn comes. That's the kind of minute data you can drill, drill down to. Outsourcing or insourcing decisions for workforce planning as well. Elevating the human resource value. So uncommon but crucial financial data shared. Uh, when you're when you work on the cost of vacancy, as we move along, we'll talk about the different departments that have to be involved. But if you don't have a, a good uh, relationship or you don't have a relationship at all, excuse me, with your finance department or other divisions that maybe you don't support that feed into the business group that you're doing the analysis on, you're going to have all these parties collectively coming together with data, which changes the way everybody looks at things. This will also greatly, and I did talk about this, re have you rethink layoffs. Did you know that it wasn't until the late 70s that organizations used layoffs to manage their stocks. Pretty interesting, right? So capitalism has been around for a long time. And it was in the 70s when they started to say things like, okay, we need to cut costs. The first place we're going to go is our staff. It was always built more on the business and, and not looking at, not even looking at their employees the same way that they would look at production. So, do we lose our lost our I'm back, markers sorry. there? Okay, that's okay. Yeah, jumped up. There we go. No, no problem. Um, what was that? So yeah, so looking at layoffs from 1977 till now, and it really has become a way to keep your stock going up and down because it, because it, employees have become a total cost center. This will rationalize or derationalize that. 
This will say, yeah, you should look at that division that way, but don't look at this division this way. There's your answer. Um, promoting transparency. So when you know this, and even your employees know this, they know the value that comes. So it's not like, you know, Harry's division doesn't produce as much as it should, and there's this inner tug and you know, tug of war that goes back and forth. Everybody kind of knows the value of the organization and where it gets to. And you'll see that you'll start to level out. If you really work cost of vacancy throughout the organization, you'll start to level out where this organization was, the cost of vacancy was $1,000 a day. It's now come down to 700, but the other organization that was at 200 might, might come up to 700 as well. And you'll start to see the value across the board become linear because your organization will become leaner and smarter or it will grow and become smarter and more tailored and streamlined. Make sense? Right. So we've gone from what's my, you know, what's my profit and loss statement to wait a minute, I am now unifying the entire organization and looking at how much my cost is and valuing everybody in the same light. This is your cornerstone to get there. Promoting learning and development. So we know what our cost of hire is. We know that how many dollars should be brought into the company for L and D. Creating management buy-in. When you can walk in and say, yeah, we need to have this conversation because it's costing $1,000 a day, you'll get a lot more people in the room. And then last but not least, the value and effectiveness of us, of talent acquisition, of you, of what you're doing, of what HR is doing, what talent act is doing, increasing the recruiter's value to the organization. So when you run the cost of vacancy on yourself, make sure everybody knows what it is. It's a little hard to pull the trigger and let you go. Again, if we go back to that model with, okay, maybe the requisitions are lower now. However, we know that there's a churn. And if we aren't prepared for the churn and my team isn't, my talent, my recruiters aren't in place to do that, my talent team is in place to do that, we're going to risk. Our risk goes higher. Anytime finance gets involved in saying, how can we cut costs? They look at the risk, right? So knowing what the cost of vacancy is you can bring that to finance and that helps mitigate the cost across the board. Just a smarter way of doing it. Gain your hiring manager's trust, right? So you can use it to say, we know that it's costing us $600 a day. So before you take vacation, maybe you want to interview. Um, you know what my cost is if I'm not here for you. Really changing the conversations, bringing it back to the economics as compared to how people feel, um, which changes how people feel, right? You want to, want to change how people feel you give substance information to get it there and everybody gets on the same page. We keep losing Jeff. Sorry about that. I'm having a hard time without the deck. Um, but basically building that employee trust, taking it to the next level. Here we go. Coming back. Okay. Just if you want to send me the deck, because like maybe since I'm not losing connection, I can pull it up. Okay. Um, it should be an email if you still if you have that up. Yeah, I'll get it in a second. And then more accurate budgeting, which is what we had already talked about. Let's just move to the next slide. I don't want to jump out if I don't have to. So the human toll of vacancy. These are some of the pieces that we did talk about a little bit more, but they told me they'd send out offers in two weeks and refuse and refusal shortly after. I've been there three months and I have heard nothing. Um, or they offer a position and it takes HR six weeks to get the contact. Reputation plus engagement and cost among the existing employees and applicants. You can take it from TikTok. These are quotes that came from TikTok, which is the biggest voice right now that's out there. Um, or the the I, it's not maybe not the largest voice, although I suspect it is. I don't know that for a fact, but it, it is where you can get a good sense. Everybody says glass door. Take a look at what they're saying about you on TikTok. It's just got a wider stretch in that respect. Okay. So who should be involved? This is what you're going to need to get there. So to gain the revenue, to say what is that top line number, finance and business operations, that's who can tell you that. They can tell you what their total cost is, and you'll probably have to calculate the rest. I'm sorry, they'll tell you what their total revenue is, what they think is coming from there. And many of them won't know, by the way. So you may have to really work with finance and business together to get there. But hey, you're the one leading that charge. Look at you. The cost, finance, human resources, talent acquisition, learning, and development. All four of those prongs have to be together to really determine the cost. Okay, Jess. So before you put the line in the sand and bring this data back, I wanted to make sure that I show you a sample of a case study 
this is set from 2017 to 2021 um, because I wanted to show the progression of the cost of vacancy and the employees. Right? So if we're looking at the rate of the cost of vacancy, here's our, our marker where these two, the amount of employees meet, intersect, and then you're going to see your cost of vacancy actually drop. But then it's naturally going to come back up as this continues to increase and crisscross about here. This is a long-term metric. You can use it in the short term, especially if you're thinking about downsizing or looking at a division. But tracking the cost, once you start, don't stop. You can do this every six months once you've got it down to a science or a minimum once a year. When this goes into workforce planning, it changes everything. But looking at it year over year will help you not only determine it was this is you know, is it still a relevant division? Is it still a relevant position bubbling up to a division? Is it still a relevant product, right? And then looking at what the trajectory is and not pulling the trigger too soon. This is a natural part of cost of vacancy that you'll see this, this gap that creates. And then it takes time to balance it out. So before you rush into any decisions on this, looking at the long-term picture and realizing when it's skewed, it will balance itself back out before you pull the trigger on anything. Any questions that the group has from here? Jess, I don't know if you can see the panels or not. I can see the panel, but we haven't gotten any yet, Christine. Okay. So I'm gonna surmise that everybody knows what this is at this point. I think it's sinking it. Yeah. And I know that this is a big stretch for a lot of people and, you know, you're doing like a thousand things a day, but I, I'm telling you, it's a game changer that's really a, worth a worthy look. So the position's profit to the company this is a very specific to each position. Begin by looking at the objective of the position and how it ties into the company and then how revenue ties into the profit. So thinking in terms of just this position. What's the objectives of the position? Let's say it's a customer, says, um, customer service position. It's to gain the trust of the customer. How does that tie into the company revenue? Customers that are retained are worth how much? Finance doesn't know this. They'll figure it out because nobody wants to be put on the spot, right? I hope there's finance people in here, but I hope they don't hate me after this. But this truth out, if you don't know that number, you want to know it, right? And then how does that tie to the revenue? And then how does it tie to profit? So in this case, we're giving an example, retention of a customer, profit from each customer, multiplied by the average amount of retained customers, divided by the amount of employees in the position. So this is how much profit we get from a customer, and then how much from the retained customers, right? And then divide that by the amount of employees in the position, and now you've got your profit. In this case, $60 per customer, multiplied by the average retained customer, which was 6,000 divided by the employees in customer service, which was 200, $1,800. New customers as of the customer's referrals. So we're still adding to that revenue. New customer referrals, 2,000 divided by the 200, comes up to the 10. Reduced overtime. Now we're taking these factors in the place and putting that back into a revenue model. Now we're at 2,852. Loss of upsells, now we're at 1646. The revenue per, per, per position for this customer service position is $6,298. The total for year one, 75,576. This is built, by the way, on a real customer service model. Everybody kind of looks at customer service and says, you know, what are they doing? Well, $75,000 in revenue. We'll get to the cost in a second. It's coming from the customer service group. And you'll see that year two, we track it year two, year three, year four, and your costs are going to change substantially over those years because your biggest load is when you onboard, when you recruit and onboard. Okay. Unless, of course, you have an anomaly of a huge influx in the market, like we did in, during COVID when we saw huge salary increases in certain segments, including recruiting. We saw 20% increases. So that's creating your revenue. So using it wisely in talent acquisition, combating interview reluctance. I think I touched on this earlier when I said, okay, I can't get Harry, the, the manager to interview and he's leaving on vacation, but it's $1,100 a day that these positions are open. That changes whether or not he'll squeeze you in before he leaves. 
Um, if you can't get him to get, I, you know, it's like comes from call reluctance. I can get Harry to call me back because he knows the value of this position. Lost you again. Going to go to a customer one we're here. So we all know a solid EVP for truly galvanizes their culture externally, where it feels that TA should build their own personal value proposition in order to gain the trust of their internal stakeholders. Yes, Kevin, could, could not, could, Kevin, thank you, could not uh, have been better said. And the cost of vacancy is going to get you there, right? It's one of the key ingredients that's going to help build that. Nice comment. Determining what positions should take precedence. How about that? How about when you look back, if you're a team leader or you're leading TA or you're doing your own work and, you, and your hiring manager is saying, I need this one, I need, and the cost of vacancy for that is $200 a day, and the cost of vacancy is $7,000 a day over here. Now you're able to say, what should I be working on first? Which, you know, which one of these positions now you know? You're also able to say to the $200 hiring manager, there's a difference here, right? And the difference is that this is $7,000 a day and you're $200 a day. So I'm getting to you, but you're in a different position. Not that one is more important than the other, but the speed of hire is important as far as the cost of the organization. So explaining your strategy to the business, strengthening your relationship with finance, and strengthening your collaboration with business partners. So Kevin, back to your point, here, here is your value proposition, Intel and acquisition, and where it's going. You're having trouble? Oh, okay. Am I still on? There we go. Uh, you're frozen? I'm frozen. So you don't get going into the deck. I'm sorry. I'm going to go in and get the deck. Got the deck. I lost connection. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> so sorry about this. There we go. Somebody's answering. Oh, great. Thank you, Chica. All right. I've got the deck. Yes, just back and on back. So here we are. Thank you so much, Chica. Okay. So takeaways. Think of the cost of vacancy as a profit and loss statement. We talked about that at the beginning. The COV can be accomplished, can accomplish cultural goals as well as financial goals. So it's a two-part win. Collaborating with multiple departments brings the best, best and most accurate outcomes. It can also be your excuse to finally align with all these other divisions within your organization. Components of the cost of vacancy can be very specific and require in-depth consideration. In case you haven't noticed already, this data is really important data that can influence a lot of people's work. The productivity of the organization, the actual products, services that are coming from your organization, not to mention, of course, the people organization. It is something that I think is a good foundation, but you should always hold close to your vest. Um, so that irrational decision, you know, use it wisely, use your powers for good in this, so that you can make really accurate decisions and propel ap ap accurate decisions from the people that you share it with. I would also be extremely careful with who you share this with, because we all have agendas, right? And, you know, the thing about metrics and statistics is that it can be subjective. 
if I want to show my point, I may take something like this and misconstrue it to others so that I can make my case. I'd rather see us in talent acquisition agnostic to the division outside of the division help bring that to the table as compared to somebody trying to use it to make a case either to go with um, go in a direction or not. The C of V can change and should be monitored. Adjusting, uh, adjusting is easier than creating. This is not an easy task up front. I think that's one of the reasons that we get calls for it. Um, we enjoy teaching you how to do it, but if you don't know how to do it, you can call us to do it. Once it's in place and once you've done it or if we've done it for you, what you'll see is adjusting it is much easier than creating it. So once the structure is there, it's almost like, oh, I have a profit and loss tool that I use, whether it's, you know, whatever the, the organization is using, once it's created, once it's done for the first time, subsequent to that becomes much easier. The cost of vacancy packs a big impact. Therefore, it's worth the work. I know it's a lot, but it's worth the work. Start with one position. Start with the end in mind of what you're trying to gain, the information that you're trying to gain, but everything else, throw out your logic on everything else because this number never ceases to surprise me. All divisions that we think should be in existence go away and divisions that really need to be boosted that companies are thinking about eliminating stay in place. It's that important. And it's our time in TA to be able to do that. So I hope we gave you some good information. I don't, do you see any more questions, Jess? Um, I don't right now see any more questions. Jess is going to send a follow-up email. Again, I, I apologize for the lag and for the little bit of technology. I wish I could show you the beautiful place that we're in. Um, by the way, say hi, Heather. This is Heather Join. She's the chief talent off our chief talent acquisition officer here at um, Optimum Maltese in New York, Long Island. She's nice enough to host us. Thank you very much, Heather. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great lunch. Um, look forward to seeing you all again next month when we are, what are we doing next month? Right. Diana Fusiletti from DraftKings will be on, um, growing at a big clip, and she's done just a stellar job. So you'll get an announcement about that. We look forward to seeing you then. And, and as always, thanks for joining. Bye now.